Hello everyone, uh, I'm Abdelaziz al -Dasri. we are group 1, and my teammates are Layla, Lulwa, Logan, and Ahmed. Today we will be talking about extreme poverty and hunger. We chose this topic due to the huge number of people that are affected by hunger and poverty. Now, I will walk you through the agenda of this presentation. First, I will talk about poverty and hunger in Africa in general, then I will move to introduce each country that we chose and why. After that, my colleague Ahmed will talk about the regime types, then Logan, Lulua, and Leila will be talking more in depth about Togo, Angola, and Nigeria. Lastly, Ahmed will give a brief conclusion. Now moving to poverty and hunger in Africa, one of the eight millennium development is to end the poverty and hunger. Also, 27.4% of the population in Africa, which means one in four Africans was classified as severely food insecure in 2016, which is almost four times as high as any other region. In addition, 47 to 50% of the total population live below the poverty level. To have a better understanding of poverty and hunger in Africa, we need to look at what causes all of this. First, conflict and violence have been direct and indirect impacts on all levels of the food system, leading to food insecurity and hunger. Conflict often puts constraints on employment and income opportunities, uh, which affects an individual ability to acquire food. Conflict can also affect exports and imports, which can lead to limited food availability and affordability. Availability of food can also be affected if resources such as land, equipment, etc., that are used to produce food are destroyed during this time, uh, during, sorry, this, um, during times of conflict. Environments such as water shortages can have determinant impacts on food security. In 2017, 23 countries experienced food crisis to, due to climate and weather conditions. Two thirds of these countries were in Africa affecting approximately 32 million people. Government, um, uh, I mean, poor governance and policies also lead to hunger due to insufficient uh, access to food. And lastly, corrupted governments uh, lead to food insecurity and poverty. Now I'll introduce each country that we chose. Starting with Togo, Togo is a West African nation on the Gulf of Guinea, which has a population of 7.9 million and a total area of around 57,000 uh, kilometers squared. Togo was colonized by the France in 1916 and it, uh, achieved fully independence in 1960. Angola is a country on the west coast of southern Africa. It's the seventh largest country in Africa and has uh, a total area of around 1.2 uh, um, million uh, kilometers uh, squared and uh, has a population of 30.8 million. Angola was colonized by the Portugal in 1575 and achieved fully independ independence in 1975. Nigeria, Nigeria is an African country on the Gulf of uh, Guinea and had a population of 195.9 million and a total area of around uh, 923 kilometer uh, squared. Nigeria was colonized by the British in uh, by the British in 1914 because of the natural resources. Also, it was one of the most profitable colonies and achieved full independence in 1960. 
Now moving to why we chose these um, three uh, countries. First is because these three countries share the same level of poverty and hunger back in 2000 uh, when the MDG goal began. Also, Angola has reduced poverty and hunger significantly. Togo is making strides in reducing poverty and hunger. Still, uh, Nigeria still uh, are still struggling um, to reduce poverty and hunger. Now I'll leave you with Ahmed uh, and he will talk more about the regime types. Naomi Chazen explains the lens through which African politics can be analyzed. She explains six typology regimes, which are administrative hegemonic, pluralist, party mobilizing, party centralist, personal coercive, and populist. Um, it attempts to illustrate the political realities of the African countries between 1951 and 1999. The countries chosen by the group belong to different regimes. Nigeria and Togo are included in the administrative hegemonic regimes whereas Angola is included in the party centralist regimes. To begin with, administrative hegemonic regimes relate to three key institutions, which are the executive, the bureaucracy, and the coercive apparatus. For these regimes, policy decision revolves around the leader and his close advisors. The bureaucracy carries out mainly specific technical and professional decisions. As for the coercive apparatus, the military are more generally under control. As this type of regime seems to be exclusionary, major actors are involved in the decision-making process. For example, policymakers and interest group leaders can be found cooperating with governmental institutions. State resources and state office are being used to construct a state managerial class. This type of regime has been marked by the solidity of the dominant class. Um, the administrative hegemonic regime has been known to encourage foreign investments, but in the same time, poor distribution of resources. Um, some conflicts has arisen mainly within the elite or among factions organized by members of the ruling class. Apparently, this regime has acquired certain degree of stability through flexibility and response to the dominant class and ethnic forces. Chesna reminds us that within the administrative hegemonic regime, there are varying degree of stability. Some regimes are more competitive than others. For example, strife-ridden administrative competitive regime, such as Nigeria, and the other one is the patrimonial administrative regime, which includes Togo. On the other hand, Angola is included in the party centralist regimes which are a quite distinct form of regime since the collapse of the Soviet Union. Their traits are mainly extensive central control and direction. They have been less tolerant to the local social force demands and they also have been quite reluctant with the external actors. The unity party goes above the administrative structures and in some countries the military's presence too pronounced. This type of regime usually rejects state-society relations, although some exceptions can be found. Violent rebellion has been a constant concern as well, and the party centralist regime was engaged in a state-owned institution. We will now view Togo in detail. This country has made significant efforts to lower poverty rates, but has not succeeded as much as other African countries, so we chose it as our middle ground country. Togo is a small Western African country situated between Benin and Ghana. It has access to the coast on its southern border, allowing for easy imports and exports. As you can see, the leading exports are products of the oil, mining, and agricultural sectors. Togo has a GDP of about 5.4 billion US dollars. Togo has a population of about 8.3 million people. Of these people, over half are living below the global poverty line. And of these people, over half are under the age of 18. In the 1990s, Togo was making little effort to lower poverty rates. There was poor governance and human rights policies. Opposing parties staged strikes and civil disobedience. 
but eventually a multi-party system was established and a democratic constitution was adopted. Despite these seemingly great efforts, there's a lot of corruption in the government. In addition, ivory trade was very common and people even believed it was necessary due to how impoverished the country was at the time. In 2005, Far Nisingbe was elected as president. Since then, Togo has made significant changes in efforts to lower its poverty rate. This includes programs such as the National Agriculture and Food Security Investment Program that began in 2011. This would help facilitate growth of the country due to Togo's heavy reliance on agriculture. This program would provide agricultural training to small-scale farmers, as well as constructions of facilities and roads to allow for increased productivity. The World Bank has funded other significant programs, building schools, potable water systems, and health centers. The World Bank has also created Togo's strategy for accelerated growth and employment promotion. This program provides $9 per month to 14,000 family, families in low-income households. This is to help them escape the poverty. It may not seem significant, $9 per month, but the average yearly salary in Togo is just $1,000 per year. So $9 a month can be a great help. In the past decade or so, Togo has reduced its poverty rate by over 6%, down to 55.1%. As of February 2020, so just a couple of months ago, Nsingbe was re-elected for his fourth consecutive term with 72% of the votes. And in addition, local elections for municipal councillors was held for the first time in 32 years. Although corruption is still present in Togo, it has seen a decrease since the 1990s. And if Togo continues on this path, they will see poverty rates continue to drop and hopefully they can get below 50% by 2022. As we have mentioned earlier, a little background about Angola, and now I'm going to dig, dig deep into why we chose Angola for this specific MDG goal. First of all, we chose Angola to be the country that has successfully mastered uh, poverty and has went above the poverty line due to their different politics, economy, and different steps that they have taken. So, first of all, about the economy, a third of Angola's economy is a contribution from the oil sector, meaning a third of that is contributing to the GDP of the country. Also, in addition to that, 90% of Angola's exports are from the oil industry. As you can see here in the bottom right corner, we have a chart that includes different things that are contribution to it. Angola's economy, and as you can see, oil and mining come as number one. However, in the past few years, after ending the Civil War in 2002, Angola has continued to develop many different ways in order to decrease the reliance and dependence on oil. However, they still depend on oil, um, even though the oil price really um, affects their production due to that being uh, the production of oil costing very, very high, and the price of oil is quite low. Moving on, we come to Ang Angola's politics. So first of all, good thing is that the politi pol political sorry, stability was achieved after the end of the Civil War, as I mentioned, that ended in the year 2002. In, order, in addition to that, there have been many developments that contributed to the political stability. And that is because of different regimes and laws that were passed. And actually, recently, Angola has been leaning towards democracy for the country and its citizens. And that is um, due to the elections that are coming up. And they established that in 2010. A constitution established the presidential parliamentary system where the president is no longer elected by direct popular vote, but instead as the head of the party winning the most seats. And the first local election is set for the year 2020, the year we are currently in. Therefore, there is more um, assertive set for democracy and they're dem demonstrating this in order to keep their political and a peaceful stability in the country. <laughs> Moving on to poverty. 
40% of Angola's population is classified as poor today. Rather, in 2008, 30% were classified as poor. And since we are looking at the goals that have been established in that time frame after the Civil War between 2002 and 2008, 30% uh, is much lower than 40% that is that we are looking at right now. This was due to many different um, derivations like war and diseases, and I will dig a little deeper into the causes of the poverty in the next slide. So, there are five causes of poverty. First of all, the Civil War. The Civil War lasted 27 years, from 1975 to, the, to 2002. There were many, many people killed, and this has really displaced the population. And the country has not really recovered from uh, fighting poverty, and that is why we see it increase up to, up to today, but however, it was 30% in 2008. The next reason is the high fertility rate. Um, a lot of the population is growing essentially from day to day and from year to year, and that is really affecting poverty. The third is the lack of health care. Due to the high population and a lot of people needing health care, the ratio of a doctor or a physician to a normal person is very, very, very low. For example, for every 10,000 people or more, there's only one physician. And this has really caused poverty to increase over the few uh, years. Uh, next, we go to the low education rates. And again, going back to the high fertility rate, people bringing more kids into the country and the population growing, the education seems to fall down because of that. Because about 42% of Angola's population is under the age of 15, which means that is a huge chunk of the population that requires education at that time, whereas people with older age um, have already received their education um, many, many years ago. And then lastly, we look at the unequal distribution of wealth. There is stability in the economy, however, there's an unbalanced economy as well, because there are a lot of corrupt people in the country that seem uh, to have more wealth, and therefore there is a very um, unequal distribution of the wealth. There are really, really rich people really 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 poor people and and therefore there are people that receive less than a dollar a day in the capital of angola which is londa it is also one of the most expensive cities in the world which doesn't make sense meaning um having a lot of the population of that city impoverished so with, with these causes of poverty, there is poverty that exists in Angola. However, as well as poverty, there is a stable economy and politics and lower um, poverty than the next two countries that my colleagues are going to explain to you and why we chose them. They are very similar countries in terms of wealth, in terms of economy, like the oil and gas distribution, and in terms of poverty, however, Angola has looked at the MDG goal that was chosen for this project in a more successful way than the next two countries uh, that will be discussed by my colleagues. Now, let's focus our attention on the country of Nigeria. Nigeria was chosen as one of our countries to study in our MDG goals because of the example of a nation that has not reduced poverty and is still struggling to improve conditions in its country. In exploring Nigeria, one of the most prominent characteristics of the country is the fact that it has a large percent of its population living in poverty. With a population of around 180 million people, 100 million of that total population is living in poverty. Additionally, Nigeria has overtaken India as the country with the largest percent of extreme poverty as of 2018 with 86.9 million people living in this extreme poverty grouping. And just to to note that extreme poverty 
is any individual who makes less than $1.9 per day. With poverty comes hunger. Nearly 5.1 million people in Nigeria are malnutrition, as well as one third of children under the age of five having stunted growth because of this malnutrition. Another important thing to note is that households headed by females are more likely to have high rates of food insecurity. Women who are in low income countries like Nigeria often have less opportunity to gain employment due to gender inequality, thus being unable to feed their families. Looking at the state about a Mamwe, Burun, and Yerb, all located in Nigeria, 55% of female headed households are food insecure. This mass amount of people living in extreme poverty and hunger can be even more shocking because this country is the sixth largest exporter of oil. This is this country with plenty of oil wealth. However, this wealth is only distributed among a few rich people in Nigeria. Almost ironically, the top five richest people in Nigeria could essentially end poverty with their own capital. Obviously, this has not happened. What makes the situation worse is that the government of Nigeria does not seem to be making major strides in improving this. As Nigeria, as the Nigerian government has essentially facilitated this neglect with corruption, as well as being incompetent in attempting to fix this crisis of poverty and, and hunger. So, this all begs the question as to why Nigeria is so poor. One of the most prominent reasons is quite simply that the government and the economic elite are not making large enough efforts to bring people above, po above the poverty line, leaving millions poor and hungry. The government is making money on tax revenue, but is only allocating a low 5% on education and 3 on health initiatives. This leaves 10 million children without an education and 66% of people illiterate. And this can only contribute to lo more low paying jobs and little room to advance in any career. People living in poverty are only kept living in poverty with ineffective and weak labor laws that are implemented by the government and have, they give them low minimum wages and do not help close gender wage gaps. Additionally, the taxation of the people in the country is beneficial to the rich and not the middle or low class. This is due to the multiple and not to mention arbitrary taxes that are put upon the working class and the tax breaks that are given to the large business and wealthy personnel. A simple solution to this issue is to say that the people of Nigeria should elect a leader that will promote the welfare of the people and fix the education, healthcare, and economic inequality issues. However, as you may expect, it is not that easy. Even though the election process in Nigeria is democratic, the person campaigning for office, or the people campaigning for office are largely sponsored by the wealthy elite who will receive a certain benefit if that said person is elected. This then fosters a cycle of governmental corruption in Nigeria that will con continue to keep a large percentage of people below the poverty lines as these action to make changes in the government will not be made. Another factor that is contributing to hunger and poverty in Nigeria is the fact that the country is negatively impacted by the Boko Haram Islamic group. Boko Haram is Nigeria's militant Islam group that has caused havoc in Africa's most populous countries. This group is attempting to overthrow the government and create Islamic State through the means of bombing, assassination, abduction, and other extreme methods. Evidence of the havoc that it has wreaked is that of the 17 million people living in regions affected by them, 11 million are in need of humanitarian aid, food, water, and shelter. There are aid organizations like Action Against Hunger that have supplied clinics to provide assistance to malnutrition, malnutrition children, nursing mothers, and pregnant women. Additionally, the International Committee of Red Cross has been active in fighting hunger in Nigeria, as well as other countless organizations. Despite aid efforts to alleviate this, the country is unable to make major strides in eradicating this mass hunger and poverty. All this being said, this is not to say Nigeria is not making efforts to help reduce poverty and hunger. It's just the efforts are not sustainable nor realistic in the current state and operation. 
Nigeria's president has attempted to implement change to helping 100 million people out of poverty, a goal that, may, that can be seen as too optimistic. As for this to happen, there must be a steady growth in the economy and control of the population growth, neither of which are obtained. Nigeria should focus on these three main ways to help reduce and eradicate mass hunger and poverty. One, invest in the education of women, especially of young girls. Studies have shown that countries where women have economic equality have lower rates of poverty and hunger. Ultimately, giving women equal education will help foster economic growth via both higher productivity and increased market, labor market activity. Two, there should be expansion of the economic jobs and make technology advancements to catch up with the rest of the world. And finally, and what can be seen as most obviously, is help improve the health care of the people living in the nation. We can conclude that the poverty is caused by the same factors in the three countries. Most of these factors are also shared between other African countries. The leading causes are limited employment opportunities, poor infrastructure, poor resource usage, wars and unending conflicts, poor health care and lack of education. Poverty can be fought in the presence of strong institutions and equitable distribution of resources. This requires a non-corrupt government to eliminate poverty. Another thing to mention is that in most African countries, people own large chunks of land that are underutilized or sometimes not even used at all. This is partially because they are either not educated in what to do with the land or because some people are just stuck in their rudimentary ways of doing things. Some people just use the land to grow crops which are just enough for subsistence survival and nothing from that land goes to, this, to the market for sale. That can be changed and improved by educating people about utilizing the land to get most profit out of it. <coughs> Moving to the next thing which is civil wars. Africa is popular for its civil wars, either between neighboring countries or within the same country. These wars scare away any investment that would otherwise help foster economic development and create employment, which would help people get out of poverty. So, eliminating civil wars can help reducing poverty significantly in Africa. The next point is the poor infrastructures. Africa has a very poor infrastructure setup. They have poor roads, railways, and water systems. These are some of the major drivers of economic development. Investing to develop infrastructures can help developing the economy of these countries really fast. Uh, moving to the next point, which is diseases and poor health care. The prevalence of diseases such as malaria and HIV are one of the factors that cause poverty in Africa. When a household is affected by any of the diseases, the little resources are spent on treating the sick. In a worst case scenario where the breadwinners die, those who are left behind have no resources to support themselves, thus leading poor lifestyle. And the situation is worsened by poor health facilities, which can't help a lot of people in there. Um, lastly, and most important point is the lack of education. If governments is invest in education, the economy of the countries can develop within a short period of time, and that can solve most of the problems that we discussed before. All of these suggestions are applicable for the three countries that we discussed, which are Togo, Angola, and Nigeria. And this slide shows the references that we used in our presentation. And thank you for listening.